Story Warren presents Jack Zulu and the Waylander's Key by S.D. Smith and J.C. Smith. Narrated by Zeno Robinson. Dedication to Ann Smith and Claire and Myrtle Smith. Prologue. I do not receive, I take. I am between and above the worlds. I am the greatest being to have ever lived, though I began much like any other, doomed to servitude and humiliation. But I do not receive, I take. And I have taken and taken and shall never stop until I have more than anyone has ever had. In my youth I was told that my days were numbered and commanded to be grateful, but, like a thousand other limits I was given, I was not satisfied to abide by these tyrannical laws. I transcend law and life, and so searched for the breaking of this greatest limitation. I went to Thandalia and brought war, finally marching on the golden city itself. I took the fruit, killing their last golden-winged guard, and now I shall never die. I will go on and on, augmenting myself with a thousand enhancements, wrenched from the most sacred chambers of the Twelve Realms. I will be everything, free from the frail shackles of my birth lot. I have strained and grasped and shall hold all, ever striving, until I ascend and contend for all. I do not receive, I take. From the Holy Book of Rancast Waybreaker, recorded by Scribe Gelder. Dude, that was amazing. That's I just awesome. want to cheer and uh, wow, that cool. was amazing. Whew. Yes, that's a heck of a start right there. Yeah, okay, excellent. Chapter one There's no home like place. Myrtle, West Virginia, September 1984. The problem with baseball is that at first you're desperate to leave home. Then, once you're gone, you'll do just about anything to get back. Even steal. But you can't get back the way you came. You have to take another way home. Jack Zulu stepped into the right side of the batter's box, bat poised as he glanced at the left field fence. A homer would win it. It was only an after-school pickup game, sure, but to Jack, it was another step on the long road to greater things. Things far from Myrtle, West Virginia. Jack's father, dead now for many years, had immigrated from South Africa, where the last name of Zulu was as common as Robinson. His father had married a West Virginia girl after college and settled into her small town of Myrtle. Jack's background was complex, but his focus was singular. He was going somewhere. Somewhere else. Hefty Leftwich smirked from the pitcher's mound, spitting a used-up sunflower seed to emphasize his contempt. Jack smiled, anticipating the portly pitcher's inevitable inside fastball. Jack's best friend, Benny Marino, looked up from his comic book as the game neared its zenith. Pushing his glasses up the bridge of his freckled nose, he stomped twice on the aging bleachers, then clapped, looking around as if surprised no one else joined in. The rusty bleachers at Myrtle Park were empty. Benny stood, raising his arms as if part of an energetic crowd doing the wave. Jack laughed, glancing from Benny back to Hefty. Don't get cocky, Zulu, Hefty said, digging into the deepening trench in front of the pitcher's mound. Jack looked past Hefty to the runner on second base and, beyond him, to the groundskeeper, Mr. Wheeler, 
mowing the grass around the not-too-distant playground. The sun sprayed and dappled gaps through the apple trees and glinted off Mr. Wheeler's gold-rimmed glasses. Jack could see a smile standing out on his bearded face. Mr. Wheeler was a good man. He owned the bookshop in town and kept the grounds for the park. He also kept Jack supplied with strange old books, the kind Jack loved, about ancient curses and lost lands, about treasure hidden beyond forgotten canyons, cut off but for a fraying rope bridge. He'd also treated Jack to devastating defeats in a series of chess matches stretching back several years. Jack smiled again shaking his head at the strange old man in the shimmering distance. Benny sighed loudly, snapping Jack back to the game. Come on, Jack, I'm wasting away. Knock in just one teensy run and end this thing so we can go eat. Hefty spat again. Shut up, Marino. I'm trying to pitch here. Trying, Benny replied quietly, but not succeeding. After I strike Zulu out, Hefty said, I'll deal with you. Okay, Benny replied. So, never? Why don't you ever play with us, little Benny Marino? Hefty asked, taking a step toward the stands. Seems like all you're good for is bringing Jack his back. You're a clown. Several of Hefty's teammates laughed. Benny was tall, skinny, and freckle-faced, with curly orange hair tufting out beneath a faded Myrtle Cardinals baseball hat. He smirked and sat down. Just pitch, Jack said, switching to the left side of the batter's box. His smile was gone. Hefty snickered and raised his glove to cover his mouth and spoke in a mock whisper. <laughs> Benny's so pale because he lives in Jack's shadow. We're all living in your shadow, Hefty. Jack said, pumping his bat in preparation for the pitch. Hefty snarled and began his windup. Driving off the rubber, Hefty brought his considerable bulk to the service of his fastball. Jack's eyes narrowed and his hands flashed, bringing his bat around to crack against the speeding ball. The ball sprang from the bat, rising to climb high into the Appalachian sky, far over the right field fence. Jack was rounding second by the time the ball came to rest deep in the woods. The shortstop, Tommy Aegis, slapped Jack's back. <laughs> you coming to the cookout? Coach Spat says the whole middle school team needs to be there, or we'll pay for it in the spring with extra running. Please come, Jack. Hefty will die if we have to run more than a few feet. Shut up, Aegis, Hefty moaned. I'll think about it, Jack said, heading for third. Tommy went on. I heard Coach Furman, the high school coach, is coming to our cookout to scout. He's coming just to watch you play, man. Some people say you could start, Jack, as a freshman when we get there, Tommy called. No one's done that in years. Just come. Jack stepped on third base and headed for the gate. You're not going home, Tommy asked. Got to get out of here, Tommy, Jack said. Things to do. Nerve books to read, Hefty muttered from his spot, plopped down and soaking on the pitcher's mound. Jack didn't look back, just snagged his backpack and walked on. Benny was there, already on his bike and holding up Jack's. Your noble steed, my lord. Thank you, assistant butler, Jack replied, hopping on and strapping on his backpack. Assistant butler? Benny feigned shock. I was sure that promotion was secured by how well I ironed your trousers yesterday week. Alas, no, Jack said, smiling. Hey, sorry about Hefty. He's a big loser. He's big, Benny replied. And he did just lose, so you have a point. Can we go eat now? Free pizza for a poor half-African kid at your dad's place? Appalachianos awaits. Benny's braces glinted in the sunlight. I can't believe you're not sick of the food at your family's restaurant. Mamma mia, Jack, Benny replied, mimicking his dad's strong Italian accent. You've eaten at Appalachiano's almost as much as I have. Are you sick of it? Jack shook his head. Negatoriano. So, 
Let's go. I need to go see Mom, Jack said. You visited her before the game, Jack, Benny replied. He spoke softly now, with no hint of humor. Jack's mom, a widow for many years now, was in the hospital, and things were looking bad. Benny punched Jack's arm softly. Didn't she say you had to stay away until tomorrow after school or you're grounded? She did say that, Jack laughed. I guess I can go enjoy Myrtle's finest cuisine with you. Jack paused, glancing at the maintenance shed past the outfield fence, where some of Hefty's teammates were searching for Jack's home run ball. Mr. Wheeler was pushing his mower into the shed, beyond which lay the woods. The deep woods held some of the oldest trees for miles, great historical curiosities for their age and enormity. People called that section of the woods the Ancient Glade. Jack kind of loved it. Benny snapped a few times and waved his hands in front of Jack's face. Earth to Jack. What? I feel like you're going to tell me that you're not coming directly to my... I'll meet you there, Jack said as their bikes rolled down the park toward the bridge. And there it is. Benny frowned at his friend. I can't emphasize to you how much hunger is happening in my inner person. The troll inside me must eat. Troll hungry, Jack. I need to swing by Mr. Wheeler's. Run out of weird old books? Of course not, Jack said, feigning shock. I'm getting video games and video movies. Video movies? Benny rolled his eyes. They're making movies with video these days, Benny boy. It's the 80s. Try to keep up. So, weird old books? Jack nodded. Yes, of course, it's weird old books. Mr. Wheeler's always got a stash ready for you, doesn't he? He does. Man, the last one had a story of an ancient diver who could hold his breath for half an hour. He explored the coves of Liv Haffen's Dyer for years until he found a silver dagger. Benny snored loudly and pretended to almost wreck. Very mature, Jack said. Mature? Benny asked, feigning a wound. Was this treasure diver an elf? He might have been. Okay, yes, he was. Sobrin Diver was a true son of Elif Laughlin. Benny smirked. How are you so cool and so nerdy at the same time? Jack shrugged. Benny went on. I see Mr. Wheeler out there mowing. So you're just going to break into his shop and steal books? He leaves a stack for me, and I'm free to come and go as I please. Don't worry, I'll get to Appalachianos as fast as I can, Benny bro. Okay, hurry up. If you're not there very, very soon after I arrive, I won't be held responsible for your half of the pie. You always eat half of my half anyway, Jack began to peddle. It's the troll, man. He's out of control. Benny shrugged and peddled on, acting casual. Then, all at once, he tensed up. Race you to the bridge! Jack smiled. Benny always pulled this stunt, never since they were little kids. So Jack was already pedaling hard before Benny finished speaking. Speeding down the little hill, Jack easily beat Benny to the old stone bridge for the thousandth time. The bridge was a local curiosity, fashioned from stacked stone, ornately fitted and bonded with a strange mortar that was a bit of a historical oddity. According to town history buffs, the bridge was older than the town itself. The oldest Indian sources claimed the elders had never known a time when it wasn't there. The stonework was fantastic, both beautiful and sturdy. The old stone bridge, its four parapets, like chess rooks marking its corners, was featured on the town's crest and splashed across what passed for its tourism industry. One of Benny's favorite t-shirts featured the bridge and said, Myrtle, West Virginia, a good town with a nice old bridge. Leaving the bridge behind, the boys pedaled on through tree-lined roads up and down a few small hills and dips till they passed Gander's Gas on the left and rode on into the small downtown of Myrtle. Woods gave way to small shops connected on each side of Sequoia Street. 
Benny pedaled ahead with an exaggerated gesture of tapping his wristwatch. Hurry up, he moaned in a Halloween ghost voice. Jack waved him away and veered off the road, stopping at the shop nestled between Mabe's General Store and Myrtle's Diner. Down the road, there was an arcade and ice cream shop. According to the sign, Wheeler's Good Books was open today, 11 a.m. to 8.43 p.m., probably. Jack stashed his bike and walked to the door. Even though he had just seen Mr. Wheeler at the park, he knew the door would be unlocked. It always was. Jack had been coming here for years and had never once found it locked. Smiling, Jack reached for the handle. Hey! A harsh voice came from behind. Jack spun to see a policeman leaning out of his cruiser window. His face set hard with suspicion. It softened quickly. Oh, it's you, Jack. Sorry, kid. It was Officer Hawkins, one of Jack's dad's former co-workers on the force. Reuben Zulu had been the first immigrant to become police chief in the county's history. He was also one of only two blacks to have ever served on the force. No problem, Jack said, smiling stiffly and not meaning it. Officer Hawkins looked embarrassed. Can't wait to see you hit some dingers in the spring, Jack. Your old man would have been proud. Jack nodded, then turned back to the door, twisting the handle and hurrying inside. For a minute, he just stood inside the doorway of the dimly lit shop, breathing that familiar scent of old books and missing his father terribly. Soon, unless something miraculous happened, he'd have no mother either. Sadness welled up within him. He fought it down again with his rock-solid resolution to break free of this small, sad, backward town. What was his future? Fatherless? Soon to be motherless? Homeless? Hopeless? He had to do something to change his destiny. Hello, Jack. Jack looked up to see Mr. Wheeler in his favorite chair a book open in one hand and a pipe in the other, gray smoke spiraling away, settled and serene, as if he'd been there all day. Chapter 2. The Box and the Tree How'd you get here so fast, Mr. Wheeler? Jack asked. Ah, oh, he replied, setting his book on an end table. Have you come for fresh books, my lad? Jack nodded, noting once again how Mr. Wheeler had managed to politely dodge a direct question. Laying his backpack on the counter near the ancient cash register, the register Jack had never seen in operation, Jack fished inside and produced three books. They were worn. Their once diversely colored covers faded to a gray-brown sameness. They matched the other such volumes in the packed aisles, binding sometimes still bright with gold or silver words or symbols. Every book in the shop seemed as ancient as the old stone bridge. There were new books, but Jack loved the large section of old ones. These modest-looking volumes held endless adventures inside and fascinating imagined histories of far-flung, enchanted worlds. I have three more set aside for you, so I do. Mr. Wheeler said in his unusual accent. It was a mix of Appalachian and Irish with odd old expressions thrown in. He would often add, so I do, or to be sure, and things like that to his sentences. Mr. Wheeler pointed to the books on the counter. Did anything stand out about those last three volumes? Yes, Jack said, carefully reshelving his three returns on the staging case. Sobrin Diver was fascinating, a hero and an era of villains. It was cool to get to him and see his story come right at the end. Ah, yes, Mr. Wheeler said, standing slowly. Sobrin was one of the noblest elves of that age, and a good... V he paused, eyes twinkling in the lamplight. A good fable to read, so it was. Jack's eyebrow arched. Is there more to the story? Mr. Wheeler smiled wryly, 
tapping his pipe out in a used teacup. There always is. Despite him being the closest thing to a scholar Jack had ever known, Mr. Wheeler's hands were a laborer's hands, with long fingers extending to neat nails rimmed with dirt. The last digit on his right hand was half as long as the one on his left hand, a calloused nub ending at the knuckle. Sir, in the story of his last dive, Sobrin lost a finger. I hope you don't mind me asking, Jack said. But what happened to your little finger? I never told you about this downsized digit. I never asked. Well, Jack, he said frowning at the finger. It was, I am sorry to say, caught in a door. What kind of door? Mr. Wheeler chuckled to himself and closed his eyes a moment. A very old one, to be sure. Gotta watch out for doors, Jack said. Mr. Wheeler nodded. You never know where they might take you. Or, Jack replied, what they might take from you. Mr. Wheeler smiled wide, opening his bright eyes. Point, Jonathan Jack Zulu. Jack bowed neatly, waving his hand in a modest flourish. Tell me, Jack, Mr. Wheeler said, his face changing to show concern. How is your mother? Jack winced, inhaling deeply. She's... Sir, she's not doing well. I'm so sorry. Thanks. Jack bit his lip and towed the aged hardwood floor. I'm not sure they're telling me everything. I think they're afraid I'm too young to hear... to hear the worst. That she is dying, poor dear. Mr. Wheeler said, almost in a whisper. Jack nodded. I'm so close to losing everyone. My whole family. We never know how much time we have left with those we love, Mr. Wheeler said. His face was knowing and sad, telling Jack these weren't just words. What should I do? What does Mrs. Zulu say? Jack swallowed. She told me today that they need to keep her overnight again, but that I should stay home and come and see her again tomorrow after school. I am sorry, Jack, Mr. Wheeler said. You are a good son to her, and she knows you love her. What would you do? I would do as she says tonight. Then tomorrow I would find out the truth. I would go there and show that, despite being just shy of my thirteenth birthday, I am capable of handling what is really happening. I'm not sure I am. I am sure, Jack, Mr. Wheeler said. That is the kind of young man you are, the kind of man you are becoming. There is no other way but to face the truth and act nobly in love. That is the only way. Jack nodded again. I will. Have you eaten yet? Mr. Wheeler asked. Headed to Appalachianos to meet Benny. Benito Marino, Mr. Wheeler said, smiling. Now, he's a character. He's basically my brother. Mr. Wheeler looked out the window. And you are his. I guess so, Jack said. So you're not losing quite everyone. Not just yet. I guess not. Well, please know I am praying for your mother. And for you. And I hope you know I am here to help in any way I can. Thank you, Jack said, walking to the counter where the new books waited. He flipped open the top book of the stack, 
a pale plum-colored tome with gold leaf edging and a warrior icon on the spine. A history of Geldensplat after the Fourth Dawn Charge War? He asked, casting a skeptical glance at the older man. Mr. Wheeler's brow furrowed. Problem? The problem is, why have you been holding out on me? Jack said, laughing. I've been dying to pick up the histories after Dawn Charge 4. Thanks! He closed the book and carefully placed it, along with the other two, in his backpack. You are most welcome, Mr. Wheeler replied, shaking his head. There is a love story about a warrior named Colvert and a princess named Crane in the second book that will get your young heart beating fast. Jack nodded and smiled awkwardly. Super, he said flatly. Michelle Robinson's face appeared in his mind, and he inhaled deeply. Mr. Wheeler squinted at the window, which showed a wide sky above the early autumn hills of West Virginia, and his wry smile vanished in a moment of intense concern. There was a brief flash of panic, but Jack had rarely seen anything approaching worry on the older man's face. Jack usually felt cool and calm himself, and thought of himself as being much like Mr. Wheeler. But when it came to Michelle, Jack was anything but cool and calm. The beautiful and enigmatic girl made him sweat and stutter and stammer and grow suddenly clumsy. He hated how hard it could be to even talk to her. A clear memory of their last conversation surfaced. It had involved a profoundly awkward pause that seemed eternal. Jack's attention jumped back to the present. Mr. Wheeler had been talking. I'm sorry, sir. I missed that. I said, Mr. Wheeler repeated, have you made your move yet? Jack winced, and Michelle's image came to mind again. My move? He smiled nervously. I am eager to crush you on the field of battle, so I am. Mr. Wheeler said, but I cannot do that if you do not move. Jack exhaled with relief, finally realizing that the shopkeeper was referring to their ongoing game of chess. Of, of, of course, I'm on it. Jack hurried down the hallway, past three closed doors, and glanced back at Mr. Wheeler, who gazed out the large window. Jack entered the musty room with a small wooden table and two handmade wooden chairs. A chessboard sat on the table beside one unlit candle. Jack surveyed his position, sizing up the situation quickly. Mr. Wheeler's last move had complicated the game further, and the only way ahead for Jack was a frontal attack with heavy casualties. And inevitable, likely swift, defeat. He moved his Black Queen ahead. Check, he said to no one. Returning to the main part of the bookshop, Jack found Mr. Wheeler hovering over an ornate wooden box on the counter. Did you lose something? Your keys? Jack asked. Mr. Wheeler looked back at Jack, his eyes wider than usual. What did you ask? I asked you if you lost your keys. I'd be glad to help you find them. Oh, my keys, Mr. Wheeler replied. Yes, yes, Jack, I, I've lost something. Okay, Jack said. Mr. Wheeler was flustered. There's a first time for everything. I'll help, Jack peered at the floor. No, thank you, Mr. Wheeler said, squinting. I will find it, so I will. I think I just need to retrace my steps. I must go back to the park. Did you see a large bird, a crow, perhaps, on your way here? No, Jack replied. Ah, Mr. Wheeler said. Jack, I wonder if I could ask you to look after this while I am gone. He held up the box, his concerned eyes flitting between it and Jack. Then. He looked out the window again, 
his eyes thinning to slits. Looking back at Jack, he frowned. Just keep it with you at all times, Jack. It's very dear to me. And if I am unable to... No, Jack, you have enough on your... Well, just please keep an eye on it, and I... I should be back soon. If I am not back soon, and you need to go on to join Benny, please do take it with you and keep it close, will you now? I'd be glad to, Jack replied, feeling some of Mr. Wheeler's nervous energy. It's safe with me. Mr. Wheeler slowly handed the box to Jack, then spun and hurried to the door. He hovered by the handle a moment while Jack glanced at the box. Then, with a flurry, Mr. Wheeler dashed through the doorway. Jack shook his head. There were always odd things about Mr. Wheeler, but it had never before involved panic or haste. Sometimes he would disappear for long weeks at a time. Once, he was gone for over a year. Shrugging, Jack crossed over to the counter and, under the lamplight, examined the wooden box. It bore ancient runes surrounding a spreading tree burned black on the pale grain. There were twelve branches on the tree, and its roots extended down and spread in a near mirror image of the branches above. Jack flipped it around and saw a latch that no doubt triggered the top to release. He was sorely tempted to open it and see what was inside that so concerned Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler had not forbidden him to open the box. No, he trusts me. I should wait for him to come back. Still, his hand played over the catch while his mind mulled over possibilities for what could be inside this box. Or was it the box itself that needed watching? I can slide open the catch and then just reseal it. I don't have to open it. His fingers found the switch, and he began pressing on it. The phone rang. Jack spun, breathless and heart pounding. Laying the box on the counter, he hurried to the wall mounted receiver to answer the phone. Wheeler's good books, Jack speaking. Jack! Benny's voice boomed in the handset. Get down here pronto! I'm coming, Benny. I won't be long. You gotta get that hunger troll under control. Oh, I already ate, Benny said. But I've got bigger news. Michelle is here. Michelle? Jack wiped his suddenly sweating palms on his jeans. Yeah, Benny groaned. You know, the prettiest girl in middle school. Jack wasn't sure if that was a reason to avoid Appalachianos or to go. Right. Dang, man. I'm kind of stuck here at Wheeler's for a bit. Jack, you've got to get down here. The jukebox is booming, and this is the place to be. You never know how much time you have to make your move, man. I guess I could pop down there, Jack said, thinking that he could follow Mr. Wheeler's instructions to keep an eye on the box and slip down to the pizzeria for a little while. He knows where to find me. Did she order anything? Yeah, Benny said. Her usual pie. Mushrooms and olives, easy on the cheesy. Her whole family is here. Can you get your dad to, um, you know, delay the order a little? I'd have to let him in on the conspiracy, Benny said. And Jack could tell he was smiling by the sound of his voice. Of course, he's a pizza man but he also hails from a long line of Italiano romantics. Thanks, man, Jack said. Bye. He replaced the receiver and grabbed the notepad beside the rusted cash register. He wrote, I'm just going down to the pizza place. Don't worry. I'll keep an eye on the box. I'll be either there or home. He signed it J and took off toward the door, tripping as he went. He balanced and gripped the door handle, opening it, and hurrying outside. The door slammed behind him, and he stopped. The box! He had, after promising to watch it, immediately left the box inside, along with his backpack. He turned around, muttering insults to himself as he did. Why do I always lose my cool when it comes to Michelle? Always! He reached for the door handle. It was locked.
Chapter 3 Pizza and Problems Jack's heart was pounding. Too many things were converging at once. He inhaled deeply, breathing in and out slowly to calm down and refocus. It didn't work. He hurried to the large window facing the street and tried to see if he could find a way through. Pressing his palms against the glass, he shoved up. The window rose easily, and Jack hooked his hand into the opening and pulled. He glanced back at the street, suddenly afraid of how it might look to passersby. Policeman? Seeing nothing to slow him down, he leapt up and through the window and into the shop. He closed the window behind him and jogged to the counter. Grabbing the wooden tree box, he carefully placed it into his backpack, surrounding it with his sweatshirt for protection, and tucked it in beside his three new books. There, I'll keep it with me at all times until I bring it back here. He left quickly, climbed onto his bike, and made quick work of the short distance to Appalachiano's family pizzeria. Jack leaned his bike against the wall nearest the dumpster and noticed red spray paint on its side. Stupid vandals, he said, thinking twice about leaving his bike out there. The graffiti was an upside-down red star with a circle sprayed around it. Jack shook his head. Creeps. He left his bike and headed for the door. The jukebox in the crowded restaurant was playing Cool It Now by New Edition. Diners, mostly teens but some families, were scattered across tables, eating slices and drinking pop. Jack glanced around at the small collection of arcade games, two that worked and one that didn't, in the corner. He gazed around, fingers tapping his leg. Boo! Benny shouted from behind him. Jack jumped and spun around, fist cocked. Seeing Benny's grinning, brace-laced teeth, he relaxed his arm but reached out and pretended to strangle his friend. You gotta stop doing that, man. I'm gonna clock you one day. You've never hit anything but a ball, Benny said, slinging his arm around Jack's shoulder and ushering him to the counter, where both boys sat down on the spinnable red stools. I knew you'd rush over. I didn't rush. I'm just hungry. Yeah, right. Out of curiosity, where is she? Jack whispered. Why are you whispering? Benny asked, talking louder and louder. The music is so loud, no one can hear anything in here. It was true. The jukebox was still blaring, and the excited chatter in the popular establishment drowned out anything the two 12-year-old boys were saying. She's in the Ladyano's room, Benny said, nodding to the restaurant's bathrooms beyond the small arcade. Don't worry, I've been keeping a close eye on her. Jack raised an eyebrow. Not too close an eye, Benny continued. Just the appropriate amount of eye for her and... Come on, man, I'm helping you out. Stop giving me the jack eye. The jack eye? Jack said, eyebrow arching even further as his head shot back and cocked to one side as he side-eyed Benny. What's the jack eye? It's what you're doing right now, Benny said. You're literally doing it. Jack shook his head, glancing back past the arcade. How long has she been back there, Captain I Spy? Jack asked. Who knows, Benny said, laughing in an awkward attempt at casual. Probably, he went on, glancing at his new digital watch. Four minutes and 37 seconds. The two boys were both staring at the bathroom door. Benny with two fingers poised to pinch the buttons on his digital watch, when Michelle emerged and looked straight at them. They swiveled back to the countertop. Jack somewhat smoothly, but Benny's whiplash twist sent him spinning off his chair. He slapped the countertop and held on, pulling himself up slowly to resume his seat. Both boys pretended to talk casually, motioning over dramatically with their hands. Benny had the knack, a little, but... Jack looked like a robot. Did she notice? Jack asked, resuming his conspiratorial whisper. No way, Benny said quickly. We covered it pretty well. Hey, nerds. A female voice came from behind them. 
Jack spun around slowly on his stool, in sync with Benny, to see Michelle, hands on hips. What is up, fellas? Bathroom, Benny said, then let out a weak giggle before turning back around slowly on his chair to face the counter again. That was weird, Michelle said. Agreed, Jack answered. Slowly, Benny spun back around, sipping his pop. Michelle, he said, wiping his mouth on his sleeve. Forgot to ask, how is dance karate going? Michelle's eyebrows rose, and her eyes thinned to skeptical slits. Thanks for asking, B. I am in karate, which is going really well. And dance, which is also going well. My back's been hurting some, but that's normal for what I do. I'm probably going to take a little time off from both karate and dancing to recover. They have a lot in common, Benny replied. He seemed to be ready to continue the thought, but his pause was too long, and the other two were staring at him. He finally went on. Kicking? That's just one of the skills these two activities have in common. Jack elbowed Benny covertly smiling with his head tilted sideways as he did. Michelle was famous for her combination of grace and strength, both in karate, where she was a regional champion, and dance, where she was considered a prodigy. Benny opened his mouth to go on, but Jack reached out and spun him back around to the counter. He's, uh, um, Jack began. He's Benny, Michelle said, smiling. She was beautiful dark-skinned and enchanting. She had black eyes with abundant golden flecks. Her hair was parted in the middle and sprang out to frame her beautiful face in big, bouncing curls. Their dads, the only two black officers in the county, had worked together for many years. The two families grew close and had spent a lot of time together, but they drifted apart when Jack's dad died. Police Chief Reuben Zulu and Officer Stephen Robinson had gone missing for weeks on a case. When Officer Robinson returned, he brought back a blood-covered police badge to an endless supply of unanswered questions. There had been an awkwardness between the two families ever since. How's Mrs. Zulu? Michelle asked, hands smoothing the springing curls around her ears, her face showing real concern. She's so good, Jack said, still nervous and not thinking straight. Really, really good. Seriously? Michelle asked. I thought things were bad. I'm so relieved. Wait, no, Jack said, shaking his head. My bad, Michelle. Sorry. Uh, Mom is doing kind of terrible. Oh, Michelle said, face scrunched in confusion. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. She was always so nice to me when we were little. Yeah, she loved you. Loves you. We all... Jack stuttered. Were... Little. At one time. In the past. In our youth, if you will. Jack could feel sweat forming on his brow. Someone called for Michelle, and she glanced across and waved. Jack saw her father and entire family sitting together. Well, our pizza is here, she said. Finally. Service is slow tonight. I'll see you later, Jack, she said, touching his arm. I'm praying for your mom. Thank you, he said. She smiled and hurried over to her table to join her family, playfully messing with her brother's hair as she sat down. Officer Robinson stared at Jack. His expression confused Jack, and he quickly looked away. Was that hostility? Sadness? Guilt? Benny spun slowly back around in staggered stages on the circular chair, sucking on the straw in his super large pop. When he had returned fully to match Jack's position, he smacked his lips. Well, that went... terrible. So bad, Jack agreed and they both spun back to the counter as Benny's dad appeared and slung a 16-inch pepperoni pizza in front of the boys. After college, Alfredo Marino had married a local girl 
and moved to Myrtle alongside his best friend, Ruben Zulu. To Jack, he was Uncle Freddy. <laughs> Mamma mia, Jackie, you look like you just blew it, Uncle Freddy said. Pizza helps. Eat, Jackie, my boy. He pinched Jack's cheek and hurried back into the kitchen. How long do you think your dad will be pinching my cheeks? Oh, it will never, ever end, Benny said. At least he doesn't kiss you in front of everyone all the time. Yeah, Jack said. I guess I'm not going to complain about the cheek pinches. Speaking of not getting kissed, Benny said, I just want to go back to the fact that back there with Michelle, that went horribly. So, so bad, Jack agreed again. Mamma mia, eat something, Benny said in his best Italian accent, reaching for Jack's cheek. Nope, Jack said, slapping the outstretched hand down. He dug into the pizza and guzzled down some water while Benny refilled his pop. Benny drank more pop than Jack thought possible and almost ate twice as much as Jack did. Jack had no idea where it all went because Benny was as skinny as a baseball bat. Pizza was followed by a pepperoni roll and, for Benny, a hot dog. When Jack had eaten his fill... The boy spun back to scan the crowd. Benny burped stealthily. The songs these people choose, he said, pointing vaguely toward the kids gathered around the jukebox. It's disheartening. When I'm a DJ, I'm going to play the perfect songs for every occasion. I thought you were going to be a sports broadcaster. Benny nodded. I can do both. I'm multi-talented. You'll be playing for the Reds, and I'll be on the radio calling the games. Afterwards, we'll get pizza and listen to tunes that I pick. <laughs> I can't wait, man, Jack said, patting his stomach. So, what took you so long to get down here? Benny asked. Oh, dang, Jack said, reaching into his backpack. I gotta show you this thing. He pulled out the wooden tree box. Benny studied it closely. What's inside? I don't know. Mr. Wheeler asked me to keep an eye on it, so I'm not sure I should open it up. Can't figure out the mechanism? Benny asked. No, I can, Jack replied. But I'm not sure I should. I bet you a dollar, which I will steal from my dad's tip jar with his full knowledge, that you can open it, and I can. I could use a buck, Jack said and he tripped the switch, smiling smugly as he did. Nothing happened. Nope, Benny said, and he swiped the box, spinning it in his hands and examining the casing closely. Hey, be careful with that, Jack said, reaching to snag the box back. Benny smiled as the box top came off with a click, and he laughed, keeping it out of Jack's reach. Victory! How on earth... Jack began, then grabbed the box out of Benny's hand. Benny resisted. The box tipped sideways, and something silver glinted as it fell out. What is that? Benny pointed down on the floor where a silver-handed something, a knife, lay on the carpet. Jack bent to pick it up while Benny carefully laid the wooden box and its top on the counter. It's something Mr. Wheeler was worried about. I know that, and I can see why. It looks ancient and valuable. Maybe it's a collector's item, like a Renaissance-era tool. Jack raised it slowly, carefully. A tool for what? I have no idea. Benny frowned down at the handle, turning his head as Jack rotated the item. Is it a knife? Jack asked. I don't think so, Benny replied, eyebrows knit in concentration. This inscription, it's Italian, uh, no, Latin. Jack held the tool up close to read the inscription. He squinted and read them aloud. Clavis Ignum. Hey, Jack. Michelle appeared again, pulling on her jacket. Jack stuffed the tool, which he thought for a moment might have flashed bright into his left pocket. Uh, Michelle, hi, 
he said, standing quickly and almost tripping. Hi, Michelle. Hi. I'm heading out, Michelle said, a tight smile on her face as she twisted a finger and curls over her ear. Jack felt painfully awkward, and he didn't know why. He was almost always calm around everyone, adults or kids his age, but being around Michelle short-circuited his usual cool. In fact, he felt like he was burning. What is the deal with me? Michelle, thanks for leaving, he said stupidly, leaning against the seat and sliding back as it rotated around. He caught himself on the counter, then turned around quickly again. What is burning? Okay, she said, blinking. Listen, Jack, I'm starting a book club at lunch on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You still like to read? Jack felt a searing pain. He looked down at his pants pocket and saw smoke rising in little rings. It was real. The tool in his pocket was burning him. He turned sideways so Michelle couldn't see the smoke coming from his pocket. Books I like, he hissed. Then he groaned, uttered a faint, Mamma mia, and slowly spun away on his seat once again, loudly slurping the last of his pop. Good, maybe you can come by my book club? Jack smiled at her, teeth showing as he gritted them in agony. He glanced down at his pants again, and his eyes widened as he saw actual fire. His pants were literally on fire. Michelle, I gotta go! He shouted, overly loud, a second after the song stopped playing on the jukebox. He dashed into a startled crowd that was lined up around the corner to pay for their meals. Excuse me! Jack cried, dodging around them and making for the bathroom. As he ran, he heard Benny's voice trailing away behind him. The gentlemanianos calls for all of us at times. Rushing into the bathroom, Jack pulled free the tool, which was glowing hot. Ah, he barked, passing the strangely cool handle back and forth before rushing into a stall and tossing it into the toilet. It hissed, and steam filled the stall, just as Jack heard the bathroom door swish open. Benny. Jack sighed loud and long with relief, then ended with a barbarian groan. Thank goodness you're here, Jack called from inside the stall. Lock the door. I made it just in time, but now we've got a real problem to deal with. When there was no answer, Jack poked his head out of the stall and saw Michelle's dad washing his hands. They made eye contact. Then Jack sank back into the stall with a groan. A few minutes later, Benny did come into the bathroom. Jack watched through the crack in the stall door, but stayed put. Welp, Benny said with a sigh. I hate to be the one to speak of financial matters, but I am owed the sum of dollar from you. Jack fished free his wallet, wadded up a single bill, and tossed it over the stall door. He could hear Benny fumble to catch the dollar before the bill dropped to the ground underneath the stall door. I feel like that was mostly your fault, what happened just then. There are, Benny reasoned as he bent to pick up the dollar, different ways we could look at tonight's events. Blame could be passed around, or we could just get you out of town on the next bus. You could change your name and join the circus. I think we both know that returning to school is off the table. It was pretty bad, Jack sighed and rubbed his face. It started bad, Benny said, then got much, much worse. Jack emerged from the stall pants bearing a blackened hole around the pocket, and Benny held up the box. Jack dried off the tool. They replaced it in its box, and Benny fastened the lid again. Jack returned the box to his backpack. When Benny had assured him the coast was clear of Michelle and her family, they returned to their seats at the counter. Benny got some vitamin E and aloe and gave it to Jack, who rubbed it into his leg burn. Jack winced, and Benny said, Don't be a baby. Then they sat in gloomy silence for several minutes. The phone rang, and Benny's dad grabbed it. Hello, Appalachianos! 
He listened with order pad ready and glanced over at the boys. Uh, yes, he's here. Jack, it's Joe Wheeler on the phone for you. Thanks, Uncle Freddy, Jack said. Please just tell him I'm coming right there. Uncle Freddy shot Jack a thumbs up. Hey, Joe, he said he's headed back right now. Uncle Freddy frowned. Okay. He turned to Jack again. Joe wants to talk to you. He sounds worried, Jackie. Jack nodded and reached for the receiver. Hi, Mr. Wheeler. Jack, lad, do you still have it? Mr. Wheeler's voice was tense and urgent. Yes, sir, Jack replied. I have it. I'm bringing it back now. No, Jack, Mr. Wheeler said, breathing hard. Do not bring it back to the shop. Just take it home, and I'll... Jack waited, then said, Mr. Wheeler? Are you there? Silence. Dial tone. Chapter 4. The Witching Hour. Jack arrived home after a nervous ride through Myrtle. Leaving Benny at Appalachianos, he had passed the bookshop and the park and pedaled on up the high hill where his neighborhood lay on the edge of a forest. He entered his house slowly, unsettled by Mr. Wheeler's call. He sat down in the heavy silence of the family room. No one was there. Only the cold fireplace and the pictures placed above the mantel showing beloved faces that had gone from his life, or soon would. Reuben and Sarah Zulu. This unusual couple, black and white, African and Appalachian, and deeply in love. Smiling. In happier times. Jack was afraid. He wanted his dad a brave policeman with Zulu warrior blood. He wanted his mother's wise words of comfort. Jack glanced at the phone. He longed to call his mother. He needed to hear her voice, to hear her pray for him as she always did when he was troubled in any way. But he knew letting her rest was crucial. He was alone. Jack took off his backpack and lay down, suddenly exhausted. He reached into the bag and, pushing aside his three new books and his science textbook and homework, grabbed the wooden box and hugged it tightly to his chest. He dipped back into the pack and grabbed his Walkman. Arranging his earphones, he lay back on the armrest and hit play on the tape his mother made for him, featuring his dad's favorite American music. The first song began, and he was asleep before Neil Young's voice warbled, Everybody knows this is nowhere. Jack jerked awake. Confused, he looked around quickly, then blinked away his alarm. He still clutched the odd box to his chest. His tape had stopped in his Walkman, and his earphones hung askew on his face. He scanned the room, catching sight of the time. 2.37 a.m. Dang, I was out cold. That's when he saw the flashing red light on the counter. A message. He had slept right through a call. Maybe it was from Mom. Oh, no. Please don't be the worst. Jack sprang up and hurried to the answering machine. Finger poised over the device, he gazed at the blinking red light. I can't lose you, Mom. Yes, God. He hit the button. The beep sounded, and he heard Mr. Wheeler's steady voice. I hope you get this soon, Jack, lad. I am mortified to ask this, but please bring the box to me at the park as soon as you can. It's 10.30 now, and I can be here till... Well, to the witching hour, I suppose. Forgive me, Jack. I must go. Bring it, please. And do be careful. Jack frowned. Then he dialed Benny, who had promised to sleep on the couch by the phone. He picked up on the second ring. Hello? Hey, Benny. Sorry to wake you, man. Jack, 
Is everything okay? It's not your mom, is it? No, it's Mr. Wheeler. He asked me to bring the box to the park and meet him there. Now? He left me a message. I must have slept right through the ringing. Not surprised, Benny said. You could have an elephant play a saxophone in your ear and he wouldn't wake up. I guess so, Jack replied. But I did have earphones on when I went to sleep. I need your help on something. I thought you'd never ask, man. You're going about this thing with Michelle all wrong. See, you want her to actually like you, so you can't act like you act. You have to... No! Jack interrupted. I need your help on something you actually know something about. Okay, what's that? Mr. Wheeler said he'd be at the park till the witching hour. What the heck is that? It's 3 a.m., dude. Benny said, mouthful. Jack could hear him chewing over the phone. Jack glanced at the clock. If it's 3 a.m., then I may still have time to meet him. You're not going out there in the middle of the night? Benny said, voice rising to a high pitch. It's the witching hour, dude. That's bad news. I don't believe all that, man, Jack replied. Your old babysitter just filled your head with nutty stuff. Man, it's not smart to get mixed up with that stuff. Trust me. I'm going, Benny. Jack said. Mr. Wheeler's counting on me. I'll tell you about it tomorrow at school. I mean, today, at school. I'll tell myself about it, Jack. Benny said. I'll be at the old stone bridge in ten minutes. See you there. No, Benny! The dial tone sounded. Benny had hung up. Jack replaced the receiver on the wall and rubbed at his eyes again. He slapped his face as he crossed to the kitchen to fill a glass with water from the faucet. He drained it in one long drink. He took a deep breath. Okay. Jack went to the closet and pulled out his favorite bat. He snagged his Cincinnati Reds hat and pulled it on. Mr. Wheeler's three books came out of the backpack, along with the sweatshirt. Jack set the books on the counter. He left his science textbook and his homework folder in the bag in case he had to go straight to school afterward. He pulled on the gray sweatshirt then found a dish towel to wrap the wooden box in. He groaned when he saw the time. Five minutes till 3 a.m. The witching hour. He flew out of the house and jumped on his bike. A full moon shone through a spectacular gap between stationary gray clouds. The cool night was quiet, and Jack rode cautiously past several houses, a few with yard signs featuring Reagan for president or Mondale for president. Finally, he saw a flashlight waving at the bottom of the hill, by the old stone bridge's near side parapets. Jack squeezed the brakes as he approached and hissed in a whisper, Turn off your flashlight! Sorry, dude, Benny said, switching it off. It's super dark out here, you know? Though Jack could see pretty well in the moonlight, he nodded as he rolled up close to Benny. What are you doing here, man? Backing up my best friend, Benny said. I wasn't about to let you face the witches or whatever alone. Oh, and I brought a little firepower. He added, reaching back to retrieve a slingshot from his pocket. I think we both remember my prowess with Slingy here. I remember that you put out that cat's eye in third grade, Jack said. That was an accident, and it wasn't Slingy's fault, Benny replied. Plus, if we're about to face off with witches at this hour... And having some history snapping some blasted cats ain't a problem. Cats and witches go together like pods in a pea. People think it's crazy, but it's true. My old babysitter has like ten cats. We're better off with Slingy along. I feel so much safer now, Jack said, reaching for his bat. Remember what your dad said when you shot Mr. Twiggles? Mama Mia? Benny winced. After that. He said we were both in big trouble, and you started crying. Oh, never mind, Jack said. You joke about your cheek-pinching papa, but you say Mama Mia when you get nervous. I do not. Yep, you said it that day while we were waiting for your dad to get home and lecture us. I received more than a lecture from Papa Mia that day, Benny said. Jack smiled. So, did you sneak out tonight? You know me, Benny replied. Of course not. What did you tell your parents? 
that I was coming to meet you at the park to fight the forces of darkness. If necessary, I said. Don't want to worry them. And all about Mr. Wheeler's odd box and phone message. You are so weird, Jack said. No one is honest with their parents like that, you know. It's unusual. What can I say? We have a relationship of trust, and I ain't breaking it. He offered to drive down here with me, but I could tell my dad was proud of me for wanting to go on the bike. I'm not leaving you to meet Mr. Wheeler and whatever creeps are lurking out here alone. I've got your back, Jack. Thanks, Benny, Jack said, smiling. It does feel better with you here. And Slingy? And Slingy. Jack inhaled and stepped off his bike, setting it down beside the road leading up to the old stone bridge. Benny followed his lead, and the two friends silently walked toward the bridge. The Cornstalk River rushed below them, swollen from a few days of rain earlier in the week. Jack clenched his bat tightly, twisting the grip as he gazed around. The night was still. The park across the river, with its fields and playgrounds, trails and caves, was dead quiet. By moonlight, they could see each other and the silvered outline of familiar, distant shapes. But as they stepped onto the bridge and between the two castle parapets on either side of its entrance, the moonlight vanished behind suddenly swirling clouds, their ghostly gray forms swarming over the faint, paling orb. Real darkness. They walked on. Benny's hand found Jack's sweatshirt and held on. Jack was glad for it, though he almost swung his bat when he felt the touch. Jack may have been nervous, but one thing he knew was how to swing a bat. That was in the plus column. He tried not to think about the minus column. Jack's ears popped as he crossed the parkside parapets, and the boys crept toward the groundskeeper's shed. Jack didn't know where Mr. Wheeler wanted to meet, but the old shed seemed likely. It was the closest thing to Mr. Wheeler's property in the park. What was that? Benny asked in a tense whisper. I didn't hear anything. Uh-oh, Benny said. What is it? Jack hissed back. Nothing, Benny said, as if he were trying to calm Jack down. It's just bad if these sounds are so silent that we can't even hear them. Let's just find Mr. Wheeler and get out of here. Jack nodded his head. Agreed. They hurried on eyes adjusting to the deeper dark. Jack scanned the empty outfield of the baseball diamond as they walked past, half certain a cackling monster would form in right field and tear after them. No monster appeared, and they finally reached the old shed. They opened the door and jumped inside, inhaling the all-pervasive scent of fuel and grass clippings. Grody, Benny said, gagging. Smells like grassoline in here. Jack sighed. Breathe through your mouth. Flashlight? Benny asked. Yeah, Jack answered. Let's have a look. Benny's beam of light arced around the room, illuminating rakes and shovels, boxes of nuts and bolts, and the old mowers. Then, on Mr. Wheeler's desk, a note. Jack, meet me in the AG. Do not call out. Be wary, W. The boys exchanged a look. They both knew what the A.G. meant. The ancient glade, a collection of old trees big enough, in some places, for you to walk inside their hollowed middles with your friends. Jack loved that section of the woods in daytime, but was not excited by the prospect of going there at the witching hour. Not at all. Welp, Jack said. Welp, Benny added. Jack opened the door, and Benny switched off his flashlight. With a deep breath, Jack walked toward the ancient glade. Benny's footsteps followed, and Jack found his sweatshirt gripped again. The boys entered the woods. The scattered leaves crunched underfoot. Every falling pine cone, every skittering squirrel, made Jack's heart race more. Their eyes adjusted to the thicker darkness, and distant shadows appeared to shift, 
Each tree branch seemed like an ogre's arm. A small white shape shot in front of them, and the boys gasped and jumped back, stifling cries. I kicked it, Benny hissed, his voice trembling. Whatever it is, I kicked it. Easy, Jack said, his right arm out in a protective gesture, while his left gripped the bat. Where'd it go? After scanning the ground and the surrounding trees for a few tense moments, the boys walked forward again. Jack kept glancing from the ground to the way ahead, then occasionally up, fearful of a leaping attack from high in the branches. The wind picked up, and they saw the white shape ahead. Jack approached it carefully. He bent down, squinting at the half-covered thing. No, Jack, Benny whispered. Don't. I think I've seen this before, Jack said, his voice calm again. He lifted up the object and turned to Benny. I hit it here. Benny took the baseball from Jack and swallowed hard. Well, that could have been worse. They laughed, walking on with momentarily lighter hearts, till they came to the boundary of the ancient glade. The trees were so thick here, they couldn't see far ahead, even if it had been a sunny afternoon. The boys skirted an enormous oak and fell silent. Passing through a thick band of old trees, they soon came to a small clearing, a heaviness of presence, a certain uncanny gravity, filled a brooding old glen. They hadn't gone far when they heard footsteps behind them. Jack smiled, grateful that Mr. Wheeler had come. But when he turned... He didn't see the old man. A giant creature, swollen and grotesque, with wide arced wings and armed with a spike-backed warhammer, stepped into the clearing. His ribs stood out like plates of armor against sinewy mesh between. Deliver the key to Wayland's gate. He growled in a guttural rasp, hefting his warhammer high. Or I shall pound you deep like a seed in this soil. Yes, 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 yes. Wow, that was great.